Welcome to tutorial number three of this tutorial series on how to code with R and how to run some of the most common statistical tests in R. Um, thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to this session. I think we're going to um, enjoy this probably more than the previous session, which was on really some basics and fundamentals in coding in R. But now we're actually going to be doing things that are a bit more close to what some of you may already be familiar with in some data analysis you may have done in the past, which is to actually you know, import data, look at our data and explore it um, more, except this time we're gonna be doing it in R. So uh, let's just jump right into it. Um, I will say, if you haven't already done this, um, please download all the R code and particularly the data sets from our GitHub. And I've put the link here. So this is, a lot, this is the last time I'm going to remind you. Um, yeah. Okay. So the outline for this tutorial is four parts. So part one, I'm going to introduce you to a data set, which we're going to be using a lot over the next few tutorials, which is the child aggression study. This is fake data. It's not real data, but um, this data set is nice because it will help us illustrate a lot of um, not just statistical analyses in R, but also some coding principles that um, I think you'll find very useful and, and some things that you'll do often um, in R. And then part two, we actually go into importing um, this data set. And then part three, we actually create a data frame, which I already explained um, what that is in tutorial number two. And then the last part, which is the most detailed part of this tutorial is going to be on how we can explore a data frame and look at different aspects of it and get different information about our data set. To begin, and all of the tutorials going forward are going to start, um, all the R code, I mean, for the tutorials going forward are going to start very similar to this one, which is um, I show you which uh, packages you need to install if you haven't actually already installed them. Um, and that's with this line of code here, these two lines of code here. And then, of course, if you've already installed a package or, um, yeah, if you've already installed a package, then you need to load the, the package in order to use the functions. And there's a couple functions that we're going to be using in these two packages, the open XLSX and then the foreign package. So I've already installed, um, obviously, these two packages, so I'm not going to run that line of code. But if you haven't installed those packages, do run the installation and then um, load the packages. So let's let's run those and we'll load them up so they're now loaded. And then you know me by now, I don't like scientific notation, so this is just a habit. I always disable it. Okay, let's actually jump into the tutorial then. I'm going to open this up a little bit so you can see what I've written. So this is a description of the, the child aggression study. So of course, this is not real data, nothing to be inferred about the real world from any of the um, results that we get from this data set. Um, so it consists of 666 observations, um, and these are all children with an older sibling or siblings. It's a cross-sectional study um, to look at predictors of aggression in children who have an older sibling. The main outcome measure is this scale called the aggression scale. It's coded from zero to five, uh, and higher scores basically mean more aggression. And this study had a number of independent variables or predictor variables. Um, so there was television watching, uh, which again was a zero to five scale, and the higher the um, the higher the the level, the more time spent watching TV. There's also another predictor called video game playing. Uh, again, zero to five scale, and then the higher the level of that score, the more time the the child spent playing video games. Sibling aggression was basically a way to quantify the amount of aggression in the sibling, the older sibling. Again, zero to five scale, and then a higher score is more aggression, more aggression in the older sibling. There's also, a, I guess, one researcher was interested in diet. So there was a zero to five point scale. Again, higher score, um, indicative of more additives in the food. 
And then finally, the last predictor was what's called a coercive parenting style, and it's a zero to 10 point scale. And the higher score indicates that their parents or guardians of these children um, were more coercive in their in the way they uh, parented um, this child. So that's the that's the the data set. Um, so let's actually import it. So I have a little um, little blurb here, which I'll summarize now. And this is a little bit of my own personal opinion uh, about what I like to do. Um, if you haven't already gathered, I'm a, I'm a little bit obsessive compulsive when it comes to data and data analysis. Um, I think that's a good trait, at least in this little um, in this little area of life. So one of the big differences between R and other statistical software, for instance, SPSS, is that R does not actually store data sets. So you don't actually save R files of your data set. Um, rather, the way R works is that you import files into R and then you save what I call a virtual data set. Um, and that sounds like a bad thing, perhaps, but it's actually a very good thing. And the reason why is because you act, you're you never manipulating the original data set when you're analyzing data in R. And if it's not clear, that's a really important thing because, God forbid, you know, things happen. Sometimes we make, make mistakes, we press the wrong key, and we can unintentionally change the original data set if we're, if we're actually directly manipulating the original file. But by creating a virtual copy, we can avoid this altogether by um, basically never having to touch the original data set um, again once we've extracted all the variables from our whatever data collection forms. Um, and we can just play around with that virtual uh, data set. So that, that just, at least for someone like me, um, that's just a huge plus um, and, and makes me much more reassured that that the original data set is in its uh, pristine original condition, no matter what kinds of analyses or manipulations or, or modifications I might have to need in the pre-processing of the data or whatnot. Okay, that's my little monologue, um, but that's, I think, an important thing to understand about R. Okay, so since you have to import your data into R, there's a variety of different ways you can do that. I'm gonna teach you how I do it. So the first thing you have to do is set what's called your directory, which is what I call DIR, just short form for directory. And again, we know this uh, this symbol here basically means is or equals, at least in the non-logical sense of equals. So we're saying this variable called dir is this um, character. And the character is, it's, it's, we know it's a character because it's in quotations and we learned about characters last tutorial. And basically it's the address of where my project files are. And um, so I'm kind of showing you a little bit of the behind the scenes in my, in my computer, but I'll show you how you can get that yourself because you actually need, need to change this line of code on your own computer. So I'll show you. So this is the address and the way you can figure out where your files are. So after you've, you, you've downloaded them from GitHub and saved them to your computer or your cloud service, what you can do is basically right click on any file, doesn't matter, go to properties. And what you'll notice is that each file on your computer has this thing called location um, as part of the, I suppose it might be called metadata, um, as part of the, the data associated with the file. Um, and it's basically, it's its 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 own unique address, much like an address of a home. Um, so that is what I mean by directory. So it's, um, the directory for this particular file is the address of where it is. So what you do is you copy and paste that particular this particular um, address or location and just paste it right into R. And actually, I'll do that just to sh for the sake of teaching. I'll just do that. So let's copy it. Because I'll show you, you're probably going to have to change something. Oops, I confused you just yet. Um, so I just copied and pasted. Notice uh, one big difference. So the you actually have backslashes. So for whatever reason, R wants forward slashes. Slashes. So you have to change those to forward slashes, which is obviously what I've done. So we've set our directory um, by um, defining this variable. So let's just run that variable. 
And again, it's just a character. So nothing's actually really, it's not a function, nothing's actually changing. But you'll see how I use this character as a, in a, in a functional way to actually import data. So I've just ran that line of code. Let's actually take a peek at it. Um, what does it say? So I'm just going to type directly into the console. So dir, what is it? Oh, it's this character. Now, is character. If you don't believe me, yes, it is a character. Okay. So now let's um, let's go down a little bit. So comma separated text files. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Some of you may not be. Don't worry. Um, so what you'll notice, I'm going to open up the um, uh, open up my windows here. So I have a number of different data files. Alcohol is a data file, but we're going to explore that in a different tutorial. But you see, for the sake of teaching, I, I've made four different versions of the same child aggression study data. And CSV is the comma separated um, uh, text file. I also have an Excel, Excel file version of it, an SPSS file, which is a .sav file, and then a tab delimited file. Um, so just to show you kind of what it looks like, so this is a comma separated file. Um, notice every column is separated by a little comma, and, uh, and then you have the rows, and it's, again, 666 observations. Similarly, a tab delimited, uh, delimited uh, text file is uh, every column is separated by a tab. And then obviously you know what Excel files look like, and I don't have SPSS, so I technically can't open this, but R is great. I can open an S any SPSS file I want um, through R because there's nice packages that allow you to do that, which is one of the packages you just installed. Um, okay, so let's import that comma separated um, text file. So again, I define a another variable called file. Uh, and I'm saying it's this character, which is in the character is just the name of the file. So just ran that. So we have file, which is just a, a character of which is the name. And then notice what I'm going to I'm going to do here. So I have another line of code called path, a variable called path. And I'm saying path is this thing called paste, and I'm going to be doing something. So paste is actually a built-in function in R. And it's exactly, what it does is exactly what it says it does, which is I'm pasting things together. So I'm, it says paste this thing and this thing separated by, and then you can separate it by whatever you want. By doing two quotations with nothing in the quotations, I'm saying with no separation. So what I'm basically doing is concatenating or combining together these two um, strings or these two characters so that I have one long character. So let's just show you in action what that looks like. So I have a variable called dir, I have a variable now called file, and I'm going to stick them together, paste them together with no separation between them. So let's run that. We won't run the, the full line of code because I just want to show you the immediate output. So what do you, what do you notice? This is really interesting. Um, so it basically, so that was, that's the, the dir, um, the directory, I mean, variable. And then this was the file variable and it seamlessly integrated them together. So now we, if it's not obvious to you, what we have here is a very easy way to import a variety of files that might be in a particular directory by just pasting together the directory with the file name. Um, and that's basically what this function does. And I call the variable path. So just think of it, think of it as path as being the address of this particular file. So just run that. And of course, path, type in here, path is that. Okay. And now this is how we actually import the file. So we have this function called read.table. Uh, I believe that's a built-in function. Header equals true. So header is the fact that, let's actually just look at that text file. This is a header. This first line of um, first line in the text file is the header. It basically contains the the names of the column variables. So by saying header equals true, what I'm telling R is, hey, you know, import this file, but ignore the first row because that's actually going to be the name of the columns. And again, because it's uh, a comma separated file, I define the separated function with like a comma. I'm saying read this path. Header is true, and by the way, all the columns are separated by this little comma. And I'm saying, and I'm calling, uh, and basically defining a variable which I call import um, as this function. So import is actually going to become the actual data file. 
So let's run that. Um, and again, we've already talked about the head function. So you can see, what do you know? Look at that. It nicely imported the entire, um, the entire uh, comma separated uh, text file. So that's really nice. Okay, let's scroll down a little bit. Tab delimited uh, file is the exact same code, um, except now I've changed the file name. So the path is going to be somewhat different because the file name is different. But again, the directory is the same because it's all in one, the same directory. So let's run those two lines of code. And again, let's import it. But I, before we import it, I want to show you the big difference. So it's the same function, read.table. You have header equals true. And then, but we're separating it by a tab. So R, the way you tell R that it's tab delimited is you basically do that backslash and T within quotation marks. And again, it's going to be the same things. We run that and then you can see, did it do it properly? Yes, it did. Wonderful. Okay. Let's talk about Excel files. So this is one where you actually needed one of the special packages to import. It's not a built-in function to import um, Excel files. But again, the first two lines of code, code are the exact same thing. We're just changing the file name, but keeping the directory the same. And we're still calling this variable import. Um, again, it's a totally arbitrary name, but it just helps me understand my own code. So I'm saying import is this function called read.xlsx. And it's very similar to um, the other uh, read.table functions, but kind of unique to Excel. So it's saying, read this particular um, file, and you're going to look at sheet one, and it's going to start on row one. So let's actually look at the Excel file. So you can see it's the same data set within the Excel file, and it's the first sheet, um, and it's going to start on row one. And it automatically takes, uh, if I remember correctly, it automatically uh, takes the header as true. So we run that line of code and then look at it. Look, we just imported the file from an Excel file. So that's really great. Again, it's all the same data. And then finally, how do you import uh, an SPSS file? So some of you might be interested in this in particular because maybe you're thinking about switching over from SPSS to R. Um, so the good news is you, you don't really need to worry about your, your old SPSS data sets. You just keep them as their old um, SPSS files. And then R, because of a special function, which our special package, which um, I believe is the, the foreign package, which you installed, which you installed earlier. Um, allows you to um, to import uh, directly an SPSS file without having to export the SPSS in some other format. Um, so again, same idea. You, you have your file, we're just changing, or you have the same directory, we're just changing the file name. And then you have this um, similar function, read.spss, say the path, and then to data frame equals true. So it's going to take that SPSS file and say, and then just automatically shove it into a data frame format. And then it just says it's changing the encoding of the um, of the file, but it, the, the data is still the exact same. The values are the exact same. It's just how the 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 um, the data is encoded. Nothing to worry about. And then again, it's the exact same data. OK, that was great. So I'm going to just open this up here so we can see our code a bit better. So we've we've now imported um, our data. So how do you actually create a data frame? So with the SPSS function or the import X, the read.spss function, it automatically does that for you. Um, but again, I'm a little bit OCD. I just want to make sure for sure that my data is, my virtual data set, I mean, is a data frame. So thankfully R has a built-in function to allow you to do that. And it's pretty self-explanatory as dot data dot frame. And then in the brackets, you put the thing that you'll want to force to be a data frame. And um, this is just my own um, way of labeling things. All of my data sets, I, all my data frames, I mean, I just call DAT as in data. Um, that's just a habit I've gotten into. You can call it whatever you want, my dot data or my underscore data, whatever you want to call it. I just say DAT and it's just a habit over the last, over the last years I've been using R and I just do it. Um, so let's run that. So good, no error message. So we're doing a good, uh, we're doing well. I'm actually just going to scroll up so you see the, the, the let's go. So we're in part three now. So notice here, I say problem. We don't actually have a variable which has each observation's ID. So 
let's actually look at um, the file. So if you see, we got our, our, our main outcome measure and we got our five predictor variables, but we don't actually have uh, like a, um, a variable that tells us um, the ID, the IDs of, of each participant or their observations. We have, of course, row numbers, but those aren't actually part of the data frame. So let's actually create that and just stick it into this data frame. And that's what we're about to do. So uh, here we're actually going to use one of the functions we learned last tutorial, the, the uh, sequence function, the SEQ. So again, arbitrary uh, name here of this variable, but I'm calling this variable child is this sequence from starting from one to the length of of this the column dat of, of the column aggression which is the aggression outcome measure and it's going to and that's going to be 666 observations and it's going to be by one sorry that wasn't that eloquent to say uh, basically it says from one to 666 by increments of one so we basically should have uh 666 um uh, numbers uh, each increasing by one. So let's actually run that. And then let's, oops, sorry, let's type directly into the console and look at that. We just generated a, a vector, technically, of, um, of numbers from sequentially from one to 666. Uh, the reason why I hesitate is because is I'm going to explain what this dollar sign uh, means, um, but Basically, what this function says is if we, we can actually just isolate within the data frame using this, um, the number sign, the, this uh, column called aggression. So if we were to run that, it just picks out all of the, the, just that one column, which is called aggression. And by doing length of that column, it's just a way of basically measuring the sample size is what I was doing in a kind of fancy way. So from one to the sample size by one, Okay, so now we, we have this variable called child, but we haven't actually yet attached it to our data frame. Um, so the way we do it is actually using that um, dollar sign um, operator, uh, followed by the name of this new variable that we've, um, that we've uh, defined. So let's do that. And it just stuck it in there. So let's actually see if it worked. What do you know? It did, perfect. So just put it right on the edge on the end. All right. So that was sort of how you create a data frame and how you can kind of add predictors or add columns, I mean, to a data frame. Now, um, one thing I'd like to show you, which again is part of that um, Excel package, which you installed. Um, let's just say, okay, we've now made this new data frame, which now has the participant IDs. Let's actually export that. So we want to take this virtual data set and save it to our computer. Um, so very similar to importing, we do we define our file. The directory obviously stays the same. We basically want it to, we want to save it in this particular um, folder. So uh, we run that. So we have our path, which basically says, I want to save that file to this folder and then you basically, with this function, the write.xlsx, uh, you say, I want you to take that data frame and I want you to save it to this path. And then you should run that line of code and we should see it pop up in our folder, which we do, there it is. And that's how you export um, files or virtual data sets from R directly onto your computer. And there you go. Look, as the uh, the participant IDs there. Okay. Moving on to part four. So this is where things kind of get a little bit more complicated. I'll go. I'll try to be as you know clear as possible. Um, but I'm just going to show you various ways you can explore a data frame. Uh, yeah. So let you, some of these you're already familiar with from the previous tutorial. So the first function allows you to get the dimensions of the data frame, which we already kind of know, right? We know that there's 666 observations and we know that there was, there's one outcome measure, five predictors, and we just added a new column of participant ID. So there should be seven columns. And that's exactly what we see. So the first number is the number of rows and the second is the number of columns. 
we can just do that with a different built-in function called n row. Um, and it just tells you the number of rows. Similarly, number of columns. Oops, just did that twice. Um, yes. We've also seen the structure function, which is very useful. I use it, use it reasonably a lot. Uh, so let's just do that. It tells us the structure of our data. So a couple things. Um, we see all the different columns. Uh, we also see that they're all numerics, which makes sense, right? We haven't factored any of them. They're all just these continuous variables. Um, and then attributes kind of gives us a different look at the structure of our data frame. Um, so we have the names of the columns. We have the names of the rows, which of course are the just the, the total number of observations. Uh, and uh, then it has it explains the the class of the of the uh, data frame and you can just ignore this other stuff okay so how do you actually explore a data frame so square brackets are sort of one of the major ways you you can explore a data frame and the way you use the square brackets is you can pick out specific rows or sets of rows or specific columns or sets of columns so the first value um, that you put it within the square brackets before the comma is the row number. The second value after or the, the second value, which is the value after the comma, is the column number. So let's just say for whatever reason you want to look at the first row of your data frame, you would run a line of code like this. And it picks out just the first row in our data frame. And, and if you don't believe me, just look at the if we do head dad, you notice it's the exact same. That's the first row. And of course, child is number one. Let's say you want to get the first column. So that's the that would be all of the aggression scores. It does that, pulls them all out, 666, um, 666 of them. Now, what if you were like, okay, for whatever reason, I want to get just rows five to ten. So the way you do that is uh using the colon function or the in the previous tutorial is kind of like defining a vector. Basically, you're saying make a vector from 5 to 10, right? Because if we were to run just the 5 to 10, it just generates 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And what you're trying to do is a function around this square bracket, the vector square bracket, saying get those rows 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, which is exactly what it should do when we run this line of code. And what do you know? It did. Similarly, uh, if you wanted to look at a set of columns um, that are sequentially next to each other, then you would use that same colon function. And there you go. Now I put head around it just because of the fact that, you know, there, it would be three times 666 observations, which is going to just be a, a lot of numbers on your screen. But if you really want to see it, I'll just run this without the head. Um, which you can see is just it actually reaches a max point. So if you might re you might remember I told you that R actually limits the amount it can show you. Um, so that's that's why it can't show you 666 times three. Otherwise, it just takes up unnecessarily too much of the memory. Um, now, what if you wanted to not just get rows that are sequentially next to each other, but wanted to kind of pick and choose different rows separated? by you know, however many distance. So that's kind of what we're doing here. We're basically defining a vector, much like we did um, in the line of code where we wanted to get rows five to 10. So again, we're defining a vector using that C function, the C bracket function, which we saw, which is like make a vector. And we're saying there's three elements within this vector. Um, or not, sorry, not technically three elements, but there's going to be the amount of elements will be the amount of numbers that this this vector produces but the first part of the vector we're saying numbers one through four and then the next will be the number 10 and the next will be the number 12. in other words so if we just run just that little line of code it's getting one two three four ten and twelve and you can kind of see if you're paying if you're following along that we now are able to pick out those particular rows, rows one to four, and then row 10 and 12. So let's just run that. And what do you know? Rows one to four and 10 and 12. Similarly, we can do the same thing with columns. We get columns one to three and column six. Uh, 
we can do that using the same principles. And I'm going to use the head function for the reason that, I, you know, just so it doesn't just generate this long list of numbers. But you can see how it took out number one, two, and three, and then the sixth column, which is the coercive parenting style. Now, let's just say you wanted to know, hey, do I have any missing values in my data set? So we know the is.na function. We saw that last um, last tutorial. If we were to run that, we're basically going to get the entire data frame uh, telling us true or false. So let's just run it just so I can show you. You see, so it's saying false, 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 false because of the fact that there are no missing values, no NA values. So you don't have to search through, in this case, seven times 666 cells. You can just simplify your life and just have, is it true? Is, is there anything true in this entire um, uh, set of logical statements, which is what this function is producing? And it'll just be one simple answer, true or false. So this is just a dichotomous. Is there at least one missing value somewhere in my data set? And it's false because there's no missing values in this data set. Okay. Now, I also mentioned this uh, dollar sign. Uh, so the dollar sign symbol allows you to explore data frame by kind of looking at different columns. So it's easier actually if we just type it into the console. So let's type in our um, our uh, the name of our data frame. And if I do a, a dollar sign, you kind of see the RStudio shows you a list of all the columns. Um, and if we wanted to pick out one of them, I'm just using, by the way, the arrow keys to cycle through here. I can sort of cycle through the different columns to kind of pick out um, a particular one that I might be interested in. So I'll let's I'll just pick out sibling aggression just for just for fun. If I just so I just pick that out and then I press enter and then it just picks out all those values, all 666 of them. Okay. Uh, how if let's say you wanted to actually know how long a row or column is, you use that length function, which we already kind of saw above when I made that sequence of participant IDs. So if I wanted to know just, you know, what's the length of the column aggression, which is obviously the number of observations or the number of kids in this, this study, it's going to be 666. Um, that's the, the length of a particular column. Let's say you want to know how long a row is. Um, again, you would just pick any row that you want. In this case, we're picking the first row um, and we do the length function. And it's just seven. And we already know that because we have the one outcome measure, the five predictors, and the ID variable. Okay, uh, we're almost done this uh, tutorial. Uh, this is where things kind of get a little complicated. Um, so I'll go through this slowly. I hopefully won't lose you. I'm going to talk about subsetting. Subsetting is extremely useful. Um, there's a lot of very helpful applications for this subset function. So I'm going to just introduce you to it. When would you want to subset your data? You'd want to subset your data um, oftentimes when you want to get just a selection of observations or participants who meet some criterion, right? So let's say I want to just look at the most extreme values or I want to look at the lowest values or, or whatever. Uh, there's some condition that you're interested in. You want to look at just those particular observations based off of the conditions. And the subset function allows you to do that. So the I, I do this three times to kind of show you different ways of subsetting your data. So um, first of all, I the first one is like, I want to subset the entire data frame. So I want to pick out the entire data frame that meets only this particular criterion. So I'm creating a new variable um, called new underscore data. Um, and I'm saying that it is a subset of DAT. But what kind of subset is it? So this all subset functions look like this. You do subset, bracket, and within the bracket, the first thing is the thing you want to subset. Because I am put DAT, I'm subsetting the entire data frame. And then after that is a logical statement, um, which is this is the logical statement. So um, again, in tutorial number two, I went over different logical operators. Um, uh, so you can you can refer back to that code to fall if you're if you're getting a little lost. But basically, what I'm saying in this logical statement is, I if 
the uh, parenting style, if the value of parenting style is greater than or equal to the mean level of parenting style or the mean level of a coercive parenting style, then I want that observation or that, that, um, that set of the data frame. So what the subset function is going to do for each row, it's going to look to see if for that particular row was the parenting style observation greater than or equal to the mean of the coercive parenting style, right? So what's the mean of the coercive parenting style? It's five, that's the mean. Um, so if it's greater than or equal to five, we're gonna take that, that entire row, right? Um, because that's the that's the section of the data frame that we want. Okay, so let's see what happens. So let's run that. It worked, so no error message. That's always a good thing. Let's see what happened. So we got, oh, interestingly, uh, we got, so the first one that actually met that criterion was row five and then seven and then nine, 13, 14, 16, and so on and so on. So how many children actually met that criterion where their individual parenting style score was greater than or equal to the average level of a course of parenting style in this study. So we can just use the, the dimensions function to figure that out. So there was 345 kids who actually met that criterion. So, um, you know, just over half of the kids were on the upper half of a coercive parenting style. Interesting. Now, let's say you, you don't want to subset the entire data frame, but just the outcome variable. Uh, it's literally the exact same function. The difference is what you put in the first part. So we think create this thing called new, this variable called new underscore dat, and we're applying this subset function in the first, um, and we're subsetting this particular um, data, in which case it's not the entire data frame, but actually just the column. So date, so, um, yeah, just the column aggression. So we want to just subset the aggression scores. We just want to get those ones that meet this particular um, logical statement. So the, the logical statement, which is here, is basically asking kind of the opposite of what we asked just before, which is I want to get all of the lower half of the coercive parenting style observation. So it's going to go row by row. If this particular observation on parenting style is less than five, which we know is the mean level of a course of parenting style, then take that observation, right? Take that aggression score. So let's run that. And then let's see what happened. So we had it up. Oh, so we got this nice little vector. So we don't have a data frame anymore. We just have a vector because again, we're just getting, we just subsetted one column, which is essentially a vector. Um, and then we want to know how many actually met that um, that criterion, we can just apply the length function because the length is how you figure out how long a vector is. And it turns out there was 321 kids who scored on the lower half of a coercive parenting style. Okay, and then the last one is a more complex logical statement. Um, and I'm just showing this to kind of just intentionally confuse you, not really, but just to show you that you can have very complex um, logical criterion if you uh, depending on your question. So what this logical criterion is trying to get at is I want the most extreme scores, meaning I want the highest and the lowest of the coercive parenting style. So what does that actually look like if you want to code that using a logical statement? So um, again, we're going to define this variable called new underscore dat and we're using the subset function. Before I go into this, I actually um, wanted to take this moment to mention something which I totally forgot to mention in uh, the second tutorial, which might be confusing to some people who are new to programming. Um, I often am a little bit fast and loose with my, my language around <laughs> programming. I'm not always the most precise. Um, I'll often say, oh, we'll run this line of code. And here I, you know, I'll highlight three lines of code. And some of you are probably like, what is that guy doing? He just highlighted three lines of code. And he's like, run that line of code. Um, I'm not that, you know, I'm not that, uh, I'm probably not as careful with my definition of terms as I should be. By in R, and this is a general principle in programming, um, you can have a function extend across multiple lines of code or lines, I mean, 
uh, and it still be counted as a kind of line of code, right? In the sense that it just the, the reason why you might want to have it off across different lines is honestly just for visual purposes. It just it's far easier to understand the code if you kind of chunk it up and split it up. Because otherwise, I'll just show you. Like if we put this all in one line, it would be first of all very long and kind of hard to understand. So you kind of be you have to be scrolling over, and that's just a pain in the butt. So I just if you press enter um, uh, after this comma and similarly enter after this this is then or statement you can kind of break up the line of code to make it a bit more intelligible the one thing you have to know though is if you're going to break up a line of code to make it more intelligible to look at you have to make sure that there's a um, that there's uh, an appropriate operator after um, uh, at, like at the end of the line. So if I was to, so here we have a comma, which is, you can kind of see it as an, I guess, an operator um, uh, within the, the function of subset. Uh, if you, do, and then here at this line of code, we have the, oops, we have the or operator, the logical or operator. The reason why is because otherwise R is going to get confused about what the code is. Meaning if I was to just suddenly break it off, let's say I just broke it off there in the middle of it. It's going to get confused, and actually, um, R Studio has this sort of automatic function where it'll read your code to figure out whether or not um, uh, your code, uh, at least logically, based off of the rules of R, makes sense. So, because I I just created this new line in the middle of this um, this variable, it's it's technically an error statement. So, if I was to try to run this whole code, I'm going to get an error message, which is what you see there. Okay. That was a, a little bit of a digression, but it, I wanted to mention that. I didn't want to honestly re-record um, tutorial two just to mention that. So I'm mentioning it to you now. Um, hopefully that made sense. Okay. Let me now get back to what we were talking about. So how do you actually subset um, the aggression scores to get the the highest and the lowest aggressions or the highest and the lowest um, coercive uh, parenting style scores. Um, so the way you do that is again, we're going to subset just this column called the aggression. That's our, our column within this data frame dat. And then we have this logical statement and there's two parts to it. So think about what we want to say. We want it, we, we don't care necessarily if it's just the, you know, the highest extreme or the lowest extreme. It could be either, either or. So we know or we want it's either A or B, right? So for A, what we want to say is, is it either greater than um, some threshold or, and then B would be less than some, some threshold to get the most extreme values. In this case, we're going to use the standard deviation as our threshold. So I'm going to, in, in code, say, is the score greater than one standard deviation above the mean, or is it less than one standard deviation below the mean, which would be the most extreme scores um, on the parenting style variable? Okay, let's see that concretely. So what I'm saying is, is the parenting style greater than, and I'm going to highlight this whole thing, the average parenting style plus the standard deviation of the parenting style. In other words, is it greater than one standard deviation above the mean? And then after that, I have this OR operator. Or is parenting style less than, which is that, that operator there. Oh, sorry, you should highlight it. This operator, that's less than. Uh, and then here I'm saying the average score on the parenting style minus the standard deviation of parenting style. So is it less than the one standard deviation below the mean? If either of those criterion are met, then I want to get that aggression score. Okay. So that's how what what the subset function is going to do is row by row, or I guess observation by observation, look at that particular observation's parenting style if it's either greater than one standard deviation above the mean or less than one standard deviation below the mean, it's going to take the aggression score. And that's how we're going to get the most extreme values of um, 
of the parenting style, uh, and we're going to get those particular extreme cases, we're going to get their aggression scores. So let's run that function. And then we're going to just see it obviously works because uh, there's no error message, or it seems like it worked because there's no error message. And again, we get this vector because we're just subsetting one column. And then let's actually see how many uh, kids met that criterion. So there's actually 178 kids who either who have who have a the most extreme values both in the both on both tails of the distribution um, for a coercive parenting style. Okay, we've now made it to the end of tutorial number three. Um, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you tuning in, and I look forward to chatting with you for the next tutorial. Take care. Bye.